Hey, welcome back. My name is Sid. Today I'm going to share five essential tips to make your portraits pop in Photoshop. So our goal here is to create an easy path for your viewers to follow that leads them to the main areas of the image, skipping past the unimportant areas. Basically, what we need to do is draw attention to your subject by making them stand out. And how do we do that in Photoshop? Well, here are the five essential steps that we are going to cover in this tutorial. But before we begin with the steps, here is a bonus trick to automatically color correct your image. The technique I'm going to show you can be done either using levels or curves, but I always recommend curves because it gives a lot more possibilities compared to levels as I've shown in this video linked above. And in that same video, I have also shown the proper technique to use curves. So it is very important you understand that before using this fast shortcut that I'm about to show you. So in this particular curves adjustment layout, do you see this auto button? Yes, we don't have to click on that. Right below is the options button, which I'm going to click. Here we have the hidden algorithms that can be used to set the auto button and they're all good and bad at the same time. Meaning we simply have to try our luck with every image. By default, the auto is set to enhance brightness and contrast. And this algorithm uses only the RGB composite channel to make an adjustment. The enhanced monochromatic contrast clips the red, green and blue channels identically making highlights appear lighter and shadows darker. This same algorithm is used in the image auto contrast command. The enhance per channel contrast adjusts each color individually to maximize the tonal range. This is a bit dramatic correction which may either remove or introduce color casts. And the image auto tone command uses the same algorithm. The fine dark and light color algorithm finds the average lightest and darkest pixels in an image and uses them to maximize contrast. The auto color command uses this exact same algorithm with the snap neutral midtones enabled. The snap neutral midtones finds an average neutral color in the image. This affects only the individual color channels. And that's why this option is disabled for enhanced brightness and contrast algorithm since it only uses the RGB composite channel. And if you're thinking to find the best algorithm and set it as default, well, I've tried this with thousands of images and trust me when I say this, every image is like a box of chocolate. You never know which algorithm is going to work. Even Adobe can't decide on one. So they gave us all three auto options. So all we need to do is find the right algorithm with or without the snap neutral midtones option that works the best for your image and then click OK. And for most images, this is all you need to do to get a color balanced image. But if your image requires further white balance correction, make sure to watch this video linked above for a quick and systematic approach to find the perfect white balance. And if you start with this curves layout in the properties, you will only find the order button, not the options button to access the options. Hold Alt or Option and then click on the auto button in the properties panel. And this will open all the different algorithms. Okay, so with this one move, we have already made the color and contrast pop, but we're not going to stop here. These are just the basic global corrections. The most important thing we need to do is about to come, which is draw attention to our subject. So we start with step one, which is lighting. The idea here is that the point of interest should have slightly more light because our eyes are drawn to bright areas first. And I know that this is where I want the viewers to see first. So I'll take my lasso tool and create a selection around that area. And it can be this rough because I'm going to go to select and mask up here and then feather it all the way until the edges blend in the image. You can use the different view modes or adjust the opacity slider for a better preview of the mask. When you're done, click OK. For those who use older Photoshop versions and don't have select and mask button, you will find a refine edge button to do the feathering. You can watch the retouching section of this video linked above where I've used this technique on an older Photoshop version. So once we have feathered our selection, I'm going to create another curves adjustment layer to increase the brightness in the midtones. And we are not brightening for the sake of brightening. You see for this image, the brightest area is the background, but we need to draw the attention to the subject. So that's why we created a mask so that our brightness affects only around the subject. Kind of like a very soft spotlight. You can increase the brightness by using a control point in the center of the curve or using the targeted adjustment tool. If you remember from the curves tutorial before, up is for brightening. Okay, right from here in this same curve, I'll begin with step two, which is tonal contrast. You see, our eyes are attracted to the highest contrast areas in the image first. And since our area of interest is already selected in this curve, I will increase the contrast in the darks by compressing the black point very slightly to around five. Once done, click OK. And if you want to fine tune the mask, you can simply click on the mask and the properties tab will switch to the mask properties. This icon is for the curve properties and this one is for the mask properties. So here we have the density of the black mask, which you can fade. So the curve adjustments start showing in the masked areas as well. 
This can come in handy for blending the spotlight effect that we created using the curves adjustment. Below is the same feather that we used in select and mask. And this is great because if you forget feathering after the selection, you can do it from right here. Or you can also access the select and mask window from here or simply by double clicking on the mask. And if you want to add or remove areas from your mask, simply use a very soft brush and paint white on the mask to reveal areas or black to hide the areas. Now let me name this curve subject because it affects only the point of interest. So now that we have enhanced the subject by adding light and contrast, we need to reduce the distractions by using light and contrast. So I'll simply create a copy of this curves adjustment and let's just put the midtones down for a bit. Now we want the mask to affect the surrounding areas. So all we need to do is select the mask and invert it using the shortcut Ctrl or Command I. This inverts the mask and the curve will affect the exact opposite areas of the subject. So let's name this curve surroundings. Now I'm going to use this curve differently. First, I'll change the blend mode to luminosity because I want this curve to affect only the light and tone and not the color. So I'm going to adjust the mid-tone darkness level so it doesn't look artificial. Remember to be subtle with these adjustments. Just try and make sure that the spotlight effect doesn't look forced in. So we have separated the subject with light. Now I'm going to separate it further with tone by lowering the black point from 0 to around 20 and the white point from 255 to 240. The numbers that work for this image may not work with others. So you have to make sure that you don't fade the white and black points too much. So what we have done here is we created a very slight matte effect in the unimportant areas. And if you remember, we had slightly boosted the black point in the subject curve. So in the same image, we have the high contrast look along with the matte effect. Amazing, right? Now, the next step after light and tonal contrast is separation with color, also known as color grading. What we did earlier was simply color balancing or correction. Color grading is all about manipulating colors using color harmonies in order to highlight the subject and impact the mood of your viewer. Now, ideally, I just use the Palette Express LUTs for this, which takes care of the warm and cool color separation and most importantly, the feel of the image. And you can fine tune the opacity of the LUT. And using the Hue Saturation Luminance sliders, you can even modify the colors in Camera Raw. When I click OK, it creates a smart filter. And I can go in and fine tune the settings if required, or even change the color grade. But for this tutorial, we'll do it manually using the Hue Saturation Adjustment layer. Now you can select a particular color and then adjust its hue and saturation. But I'll make this easy for you. I'm going to use a targeted adjustment tool like the one in curves. But do you notice any difference in the icon? Look at the direction of the arrows. The curves icon has up and down arrows. And in hue saturation, we need to move left and right as you can see in the arrows. Right now the default is set to master, which means if you make any adjustment, it will apply globally to all the colors. You can target a specific color from the drop down menu but I'm going to do this with the hand slider, which is faster and visually interactive. As soon as I simply click a particular color in the image, it will get targeted. And you can see the color is now set to cyan instead of master. And below in these color bars, we can see the range of the cyan color selected. And I'll get back to this in a minute. Now remember, we need to move left and right with the hand tool. So if I click and drag left, it reduces the saturation. And on the right, it increases the saturation, just like it shows in the saturation slider. Now, if you want to change the hue the same way, all you need to do is hold Ctrl or Command and then slide the targeted hand tool. So if you have watched the color theory video, you will know that this shade of teal complements the orange of the skin. So I'll keep it there. Similarly, I can fine tune the hue and saturation of the reds in the hat. But when I do that, you will notice that the reds affect the skin tones as well. There is no option for the orange slider where the skin tones lie, like we find in the hue saturation and luminance adjustments in Camera Raw. The good news is that we can manually modify the color range we wish to target. But first, in order to identify the adjustments, I'm going to move the hue completely to one corner. It can be right or left. They both end up in red. And do you know why? Here's another fun fact for you guys. This is because when you bend the color spectrum bar into a circle to join the red ends, what you get is a color wheel. Also, did you notice that the color range sliders of the hues are labeled in degrees? It's because these values correspond to their location on the color wheel circumference. Okay, so now we can clearly see what areas are selected in the red color range. Now in the color bar, my reds are split in half. So what we can do is hold Ctrl or Command and drag the color bar to reposition it. And now I can see the range of my red color selected. So the top color bar is the entire range of default color spectrum. And any adjustments you make in the hue or saturation will reflect in the color bar below. 
And you can see by moving the hue to one corner, we have changed the hue of the reds in the top color bar to cyan in the bottom color bar. Think of the above color bar as the before color and the bottom color bar as the after. So the before color was red and the result after modification is cyan. And right now we're still targeting the reds. Now take a look at this. As I reduce the saturation of the reds, the top or the before bar is as it is. Nothing happens to it. But look at the bottom or the after bar. You can see it is getting desaturated. So basically we're just seeing the results of our adjustments in the after bar below. Okay, now to make my selection preview more visible, I'm going to increase the saturation a bit as well. So now, if I want to remove the orange color from my reds, I can either use the minus color picker tool and simply click and drag on the skin tones to subtract it from the red selection. What this just did was move the inner vertical white bars closer to each other right under the red color. Take a look when I undo and then redo it. So it narrowed down the selected red color range. And moving the vertical bars apart from each other expands the selected range. The top area here is the range of colors that we are targeting and the bottom is the result which is now cyan. So bringing them in back close together right under the red color targets only the pure red. For more accuracy, we can also drag these outside triangle sliders closer to its vertical bar. And while it makes the color transitions harsher, it also narrows down the color range and pinpoints the selection. And as you move it away from its vertical bar, it will feather the color fall off and smooth the color transitions. But this expands the selected color range as well. So you'll always need to see the preview and find the best balance. So at this particular range, I've removed the orange color from my red selection. Now I can bring the hue and saturation back to normal, that is zero, and adjust them to complement the background cyan color. I highly recommend you watch the color theory video linked above to get a better grasp on color combinations. Since the red cap is part of the subject, I'm going to increase the saturation a bit. So what we are doing here is creating contrast not only with the complementary hues, but also with saturation. Now I want to adjust the skin tones. So we can start with the same hand tool and click on the skin. And you will notice that the name in the menu has changed to reds too. And when you see the list of colors, one of the colors is missing. It could be any. And in this instance, it's yellows. This is because you can have only six individual colors in the list. And if you modify the adjustment slider so that it falls in a different color range, the name in the edit menu also changes to reflect the color change. Now, if I move the hue to one corner and boost the saturation, I can see again that the reds are selected along with the skin tones. So I'll use the minus eyedropper tool to click and drag on the red and then fine tune it manually. You can also drag this center gray area to move the entire adjustment slider and position it right under the proper color area, in this case under orange. Now I can bring the hue and saturation back to normal and fine tune the skin tone. The next step after color is selective focus. This step is completely optional. And this particular technique works great with portraits that already have some background blur. If you want to see my technique to add realistic bokeh to full length portraits without any background blur, let me know in the comments below. So what we are going to do is enhance the shallow depth of field by using a blur filter. But I can't use it on this adjustment layer. So I need to merge all the layers up to a new layer. The way to do this is by creating a new layer on top, then using the shortcut Command Option Shift E on a Mac or Control Alt Shift E on a PC. If you have the Pro Workflow X panel, just click on Merge Up. I'm also going to make this layer a smart object. And you can tell by the layer thumbnail, which now gets this icon that tells us it's a smart object. And you can rasterize it, that is to turn it back to your normal layer anytime you want. Just right click the layer and then click on Rasterize. And you will notice the icon is gone. And if you want to make this layer a smart object without using the panel, you can right click the layer and then go to Convert to Smart Object. And we have that icon back again. The reason why we have changed this layer to a smart object is that we can edit whatever filter we apply on it. So for the blur, I'm going to filter, blur gallery, and then iris blur. You will find that a default iris blur pin is placed right in the center of the image. If you wish to add additional pins, you can click anywhere in the image. And to remove them, click on the reset icon in the options bar above. But for this technique, we just need the default pin. First, we need to reposition the pin on our subject's face so to move the pin around, simply click on it in the center and drag it to a new position. Next, you're going to want to change the blur intensity. There are two ways to do this. This circle surrounding the pin controls the blur intensity. If you click and drag the line around inside the circle clockwise, it will increase the blur amount. And if you go counterclockwise, it will decrease the blur. Or you can simply use the blur slider in the blur tools panel over to the right. 
Surrounding the blur intensity circle are four dots. These dots control where the transition area for the blur effect begins. The area between the center of the pin and these larger dots is completely protected from the blur effect, maintaining the same amount of sharpness and focus as the original image. To change the intensity of the transition, all I need to do is click on one of the four white dots and drag it towards the center, which will give a smooth transition and narrow down the focus area. Dragging them outwards will increase the focus area but give a harsh transition between the focus and the blur. Now by default, all the four dots move together when any one of them is dragged. If I wanted to break them apart and move one independently, I could simply press Alt or Option and drag the handle to redefine the shape to fit my subject. The last aspect of this tool are four smaller dots connected by a thin curved line. These dots allow us to control the range of the blur. Everything outside this curved line gets 100% blur intensity that you've set in the slider. And the blur area inside the line gradually fades towards the inner four dots. You can also transform this ellipse from the curved line and rotate it from its handles. If you want to transform only the outer line without affecting the inner dots, simply hold Alt or Option and then resize it. You can even stretch it outside the image. You'll also notice a single square pin on the line. This can alter the shape of the blur. If you click and drag that square outwards, it creates a rectangle with rounded corners. Dragging the square inward again will reshape the line back to an oval. Remember that this effect has to be subtle or it may appear fake. So make sure not to use a very high blur intensity. Once I click OK, you will find the filter applied on the smart object. So if I double click on the blur gallery on the smart filters layer, I can access the blur settings and modify it if required. You wouldn't be able to do this on a normal layer. And finally, in the last step, number 5, we'll alter the composition through cropping. Before I select the crop tool, I'm going to merge everything to a new layer on top because we might have to extend or rotate the canvas using content aware, which won't work on any smart or adjustment layer. So let's select the crop tool or you can press C to activate it. And up here, you will find some predefined cropping overlay guides. The one we have active now is called the golden spiral, which I find works the best with vertical portraits. Now as soon as I click any corner of the crop, it will show the selected overlay guide. Now, you can cycle through the different overlays by pressing O on your keyboard. And by pressing Shift and O, I can cycle through the different orientations possible for that overlay. So with the golden spiral overlay, the idea is that your viewer's eye should follow along this path and ultimately wind up here, which should be the point of interest. This will make the composition aesthetically pleasing. So I'm going to bring in the edges, so that the spiral points near the eyes. It doesn't need to be exactly on the eye. Remember that this is just a mathematical guideline. I'm also going to extend the crop outside the image area. Now you need to be aware if you have to follow crop aspect ratio, make sure to hold shift before and then resize the crop to maintain the aspect ratio. So before I hit enter or double click to finalize the crop, I need to make sure of two things. First is that this particular icon should not be active, which will permanently delete the image outside the crop area. And second, since we are extending the background outside the image to add more room, we need to click on this content aware icon, which will automatically fill the empty areas with Adobe's content aware technology. So let's click OK to confirm the crop. On a simple photo like this with blurry edges, it does quite a decent job as long as you don't extend the crop too far. And you can always use the healing brush tool to fix the problematic areas if they arise. Now to show you the before and after, let me first duplicate this image. For the sake of this tutorial, I had to take a lot more time. But if you're just working, the steps go pretty fast. And if you use LUTs along with the HSL sliders in Camera Raw Filter instead of the Hue Saturation, it will be crazy fast. So check out these LUTs linked below, which are also part of the Master Retouches Pack, which is one of the most powerful tools we've created for Photoshop. Anyway, here is the before and here's the after. Quite a difference, right? And guys, the next video is going to be mind blowing. I'm going to reveal how to magically remove banding from 8-bit photos and you definitely cannot miss that one. So make sure to subscribe and hit that bell to be notified in your inbox as soon as that releases. And until then, enjoy life and have fun retouching.